Hi everybody, here's Christian from Lazy Devs. Welcome to this new video. You have to excuse a little bit, I am a little bit hoarse uh, because I went through a bit of a cold, not, not the COVID thing, but just like, you know, just like regular infection. But I have to do this video now because uh, there is something timely happening. There's an important thing that is happening and that is, of course, we have reached over 1000 subscribers on YouTube. Thank you so much for subscribing. This means a lot to me. Um, so yeah, today we are going to celebrate a little bit. Ah! <laughs> All right, so what I did is I went to, um, to my uh, Discord channel and I put, um, like ask people to ask questions. Like we're gonna do a Q and A episode today. We're just gonna lean back, uh, let our hair down a little bit and answer some questions from our, from our listeners. Mm. Schloss Bierbrich, trocken, fine sparkling wine, uh, made it all the way from Germany to China here, surprising. So uh, I have to say, maybe explain a little bit. I, usually I, I like missed all of the milestones, like subscriber milestones so far. Generally, I don't like to put too much like weight onto like a singular number like subscribers. That's not something I want to like um, hinge my self worth on. No, this is not my first YouTube channel. I've been, this is not my first rodeo. And I know this can go south very easily. I really want to focus on making videos that I like and making videos that I think are worth making. That's my biggest motivation, not just like pushing some arbitrary number. But in the recent months, you know, the videos have been quite challenging. I went through some, some challenging videos and so it's good every now and then to kind of like relax and, you know, just look back on what you've done and enjoy uh, some milestone like this one. 7,000 subscribers is a good uh, place to celebrate a little bit. All right, so let us get into some of the questions that uh, uh, you guys sent me. Um, so the first question is from a remote squish and he asks um, about the origins of my username. So uh, the username I'm using on Twitter and on most other platforms is Christman. Uh, and it is uh, whew, like uh, a lot of usernames. It is a username that was created when I was a teenager and it has a very, very dumb backstory. It actually doesn't have a, so anything that you would call the backstory. It's just like a very dumb username because that's how all usernames work, right? Anyway, um, so yeah, um, the Christ part is something that happened through video games because I have a very long name, Christian. And when you type it in, especially like in like Japanese video games, uh, when you t start typing in names, they, they were in the early days, they were quite often like character limited. So my long name, Christian, was often abbreviated to like something very short, like Christ. And uh, in order to, and that's kind of like stuck, you know, like you, you call yourself Christ in every game because they're not, 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 there's no more characters there to put your name in there. And uh, yeah, and so that was Chris for a long time. And then the other part, the man at the end is, uh, I think at some point in my high school, I got into the habit, like uh, there was, we developed a, a, a bit of an inside joke where we would just add man to our names uh, or surnames uh, to kind of turn us into kind of like these weird superhero phrases, like nicknames. And uh, yeah, and then I just used Chris Man for a lot of things and just kept using it. And then I've, I've, I became Chris Man. That's, that's the nickname I started using. I like to being consistent in my online persona. And that's why I also use the same uh, avatar picture on every account I use. Just so if people like find me on different platforms, they know like, oh, that's, that's actually him. And funny thing about that picture is that this is a picture that is now 20 years old. So it's a bit outdated. <laughs> I'm thinking about maybe changing it out. And also that picture is also, that's a photo taken in the elevator of the um, uh, Eiffel Tower. Uh, so next question, there's actually two people who ask kind of similar questions from Nail, 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 Nailuj, Nailuj29 and from Bretsky. Uh, Nailuj asks, how did you start doing game dev? And Bretsky uh, asks, how did you learn to develop code applications? How, where did you get started? Um, well, I started quite early. I started before, um, I, it must have been before I was 10. I'm not exactly sure when. My dad got me a computer, the, my first computer that was an Atari. 130XE. It was an 8-bit um, Atari computer. Uh, it was um, basically like, it played a lot of the 8-bit games that you are maybe familiar from 8-bit Atari consoles, like, you know, the Atari 20, 2600. 
um, 2600. You know, from the early Atari consoles. Um, the only difference was, or the main difference was that it had a keyboard built in. And when you turn it on, it just booted straight into a code editor. That's how the computers work. There were no operating system. You just boot straight into like a command line interface. That's basically what Pico 8 is. Except it's a lot more, it was a lot less uh, cozy and, and and a lot more complicated. Or like a lot less more obtuse, I would say. There was no like graphics editor or anything. It was just like pure code. Uh, so yeah, I played a lot of games on this computer, but eventually I got a bit bored and I was like kind of interested, like, okay, what can you do with this? And my dad got me some books. And then I eventually, like, out of boredom, started reading those books. And there was some code in those books. And I thought, like, hey, what if I type in the code? And then something happened. And like, whoa, dude. <laughs> I can I can make things appear on the screen, <gasps> and then you know that's how things went. Uh, you know, and I started experimenting, and then th one thing led to another. So the programming language was there was basic, and then eventually I got a you know regular PC, and then I that uh, PC like DOS had QBasic, and I went into QBasic, and that was really fun experimenting as a kid. And then eventually, uh, uh, Uncle got me Visual Basic, and that was also fun. And then I got also into HTML web design, and that that led me to Flash, and um, yeah, things went on from there. So next question, Franco asks, do you think Lua would be a good scripting language to get into coding? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, there is this interesting interview with with. Um, with uh, Zep, um, he uh, talks about how he developed uh, Pico 8, and so his uh, he wanted to recreate this um, an experience of coding basic on old computers. So the experience I grew up with, and uh, he initially wanted to have to be it basic, the programming language to be basic, and then he accidentally discovered Lua during his research. Uh, and he just like initially didn't want to be it to be Lua. He had just like Lua in place, I think, just um, as a test, and it worked out so well that he just kept it uh, because he realized that Lua was accomplishing the goals that he wanted to achieve. And I agree, like it's it's very similar to Basic. It's um, it has its quirks for sure. Um, but I think it's also very easy to learn. Uh, I was a bit apprehensive when I heard about this. Oh no, like learning a new programming language. Ugh. Uh, but um, I picked it up so fast and uh, now I feel so comfortable with it. I will say that the Pico 8 Lua is special and that uh, programming the real Lua, like on Tech 80 or some other uh, platforms recently, um, that's not quite as cozy and fun as the Pico 8 Lua. The API makes a huge difference. Next question, Pacho Incos uh, asks, what is the most ambitious projects you're currently working towards wish to get to in the future? Well, I mean, the next tutorial is the one that I'm working on right now. And that is gonna be, uh, I, that's turning out to be a lot longer than I expected, uh, but I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, so that's gonna be the Schmap project. That's something that hopefully we're gonna see a lot more uh, in the next year. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, hopefully that, that will be the thing that will dominate the next year. That would be really great. Um, uh, something that I kind of like a wish I would I have is, uh, or like a vague plan I have is to turn some of my Pico 8 projects into um, like uh, commercial releases to like big releases, basically going through um, kind of like similar process as Slipways or um, Celeste or, um, you know, games like that. I'm basically using uh, the prototypes, the games I create on Pico 8 as a starting point to create like a bigger project. Mm, yeah, so that's something I do that would be fun. I think some of, a lot of the games I made would be really fun on iOS. So like something I've been actually really thinking about is how to make uh, My Chance Sweet Buns on iOS. I think that would be uh, a game that would fit that audience and, and uh, I think that would be like a really good match. And a lot of people ask me actually about this as well. So yeah, that would be fun. Uh, also, I'm looking uh, into obviously, you know, about this, um, uh, the play date. Uh, so I would love to also get a game on a play date if I can. Next question, smelly fish sticks. Hmm. <laughs> <coughs> I always have to laugh a bit about that username. It's so funny. Anyway, um, how frequently <clears throat> um, do you swap between uh, different fields of when you're working on a project? Um, example, program for eight hours, draw the next two, etc. Um, it depends. Really depends. Uh, it's um, it depends on what the project needs. 
Um, I don't like switching between the different, like I don't like switching hats. It always stresses me out. And um, quite often um, I get, like I get, I work on one task and until I get stuck and then I realize I have to switch to a different task in order to unstuck myself in one task. And the switch is very painful and the run up to that switch is also frustrating um, because it feels like you have to leave something behind that is unfinished in order to do something else. And, and so you don't want to stop working, but I also don't want to start. Doing, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And that's the part that I really don't like about game development, switching, switching hats. But you have to, you cannot like, you know, design all of the graphics for the game before anything else is done. It's, you have to do switch in between and, that's um, that makes development really difficult. Next question, Louis Chapman asks, "What's your approach regarding planning? How much of your projects do you plan in advance, and how often do your projects usually change over the course of development?" Uh, again, that's kind of like a diff difficult question because it depends on the project, and and it's difficult to say like in general. Um, the generally the planning for the projects that I made on Pico 8 so far has been wildly different between different I think uh, between different games. Um, for example, for Breakout, I did very little planning. Uh, for Pork Like, I, well, my planning was writing the game, basically, like the first version of that game. For um, My Chance Sweet Buns, I did a physical prototype. Uh, so that was a very different type of planning. For High Stakes, I, um, I made a prototype, a very, very long phase where I made digital prototypes to test the game uh, concepts. Uh, for the chess, for Pico Chess, um, I watched a very, very long tutorial series on how to program chess. So yeah, it really kind of depends on what kind of projects, what the project's demands are. I will say that uh, something I learned from uh, working on Pico 8 um, is that uh, I've learned to accept <laughs> that sometimes you have to just code something and it's gonna be crap. And then you're just gonna accept that, you're just gonna throw it all away, and you're just gonna code it from scratch again. Basically, something that um, you know making the tutorials forced me into is that uh, it forced me to take something that I coded that I was generally happy with, and um, it forced me to take this away, throw it out, and code it again from scratch. And I, what I notice is that it was actually pretty good. I, that I enjoyed it more than I thought I would and that the result was um, a lot improved even in situations where I didn't think there was room f or a lot of roof room for improvement. Uh, um, also, it made me kind of like understand the task that I'm working on a lot better. So I'm trying to take this takeaway and, and, and incorporate it more into my work and being like, okay, Sometimes there's a lot of questions that you have to answer and the best way to answer those questions is just to make something by instinct and then realizing what about the things that you think are true are actually wrong and then going back and doing it again. But this time, you know, with the added knowledge of having done it before. Something that you have to keep in mind is that this is... Uh, something that works very well on Pico 8 because Pico 8 has, you know, our small, small projects. So it's very feasible to just recode them from scratch. Uh, less feasible, obviously, for, you know, bigger projects. Heilige Kuh asks, a vanishingly small number of people who are interested in game dev will ever make a living from game dev. As someone who teaches in various forms, what do you think hope people take away from game dev other than, than career in industry? Um, mm, I don't think I agree with the premise of this question. I don't think that a lot of people who are like, if you are, uh, especially if you go through like a, a formal education in game development, you are, I think most of the time you are likely to get a job. Um, this is what formal education does to you. Uh, I remember, um, you know, whenever we were in different institutes, the institutes were very interested and concerned about um, making sure that people will get a, get a job after they get an education at that institute. That was often the whole premise of the enterprise. And they often went great lengths of, you know, getting people in touch, getting students in touch with the industry and, and preparing them for the industry. So uh, most of the students I've seen, I assume, or from what I have seen, uh, at least briefly uh, got a job in the industry. I don't know how, how long they stuck around, but, you know, we got them in. Um, maybe the Heidi Goku is asking about um, 
you know, um, in, independent devs. There's obviously a huge amount of independent developers who do things on a hobby basis. And yes, that and that from that kind of point of view, it uh, might be difficult to get uh, make a living uh, from game dev. Um, but um, I mean, game development is a very um, good thing to to learn, I think, in some regard, because the skills that you learn there are easily applicable to other um, highly paid jobs or well paid jobs. Uh, and the obvious example is programming. Just programming, learning programming games. Uh, allows you to get also other IT jobs and those are often a lot better paid than making games and there's also quite often a lot more offers for those jobs than for programming jobs in industry so that's an obvious plus uh, for graphic artists for like 3D stuff you can do animation you can do like I don't know architectural visualization there is plenty of applications for 3D stuff and as 3D, 3D technology gets more and more popular uh, you know, these uh, opportunities even increase even more. For 2D stuff, obviously, you can do, um, you know, um, typical uh, advertising jobs. Um, you can do illustrations. You can do graphic design jobs. Um, same thing with writing. Obviously, writing jobs don't um, grow on trees either. But, you know, it's generally something that you can apply to other things. I think the only thing from um, game development that you can't really apply to other disciplines is game design. But then again, I've, um, I haven't seen a lot of situations where you just learn game design and nothing else. And I don't think it's a good idea to learn just game design and nothing else. Like even within the game industry, there are not a lot of openings for just game designers and nothing else. But even in these situations, I think, I mean, the industry is pretty big, the games industry, and it's growing as well. There's a lot of requirements for various jobs within the games industry, even if they are not specifically about game development. So there's a lot of jobs in, you know, publishing, distribution, you know, project management, advertising, one specific position that uh, I think is always quite sought after is a game producer. And a lot of people coming into game development don't have that job on their mind. And I think they should, because I think it's a very interesting job um, that has uh, requires very specific skills that are really exciting to develop, I think. Next question by Dovuro. Dovuro. Um, so he asks, or they ask, what is your uh, very topmost wish list item that you would like to see added or uh, to or changed about Pico 8? Um, I don't have too many uh, things I would change about Pico 8. I think it's pretty good as it is, and I think um, Zep is kind of on a good course. Obviously, you know, it would be nice if there were, you know, you, I could have more tokens, but then it also wouldn't be Pico 8. Like the kind of like the working within the constraints is the point and uh, being able to change the constraints kind of defeats the purpose of Pico 8. I have just like really small complaints. Like um, there is one, I talked about it. I posted a thread on a, on a BBS. When you're drawing in the sprite editor, I would love to see um, a cursor, like the underneath the cursor, underneath your drawing cursor, I would see like a preview of what the pixel will look like before you click the way it is in Sprite. Right now you move the cursor on the on the drawing board and there's nothing there. And you click and then the, the pixel appears. I would see, love to see that pixel that would, would appear before you click. Um, because that gives you an idea of how big the pixels are. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've written a thread about that, but it hasn't been implemented. So maybe Zep doesn't want it for some reason. Um, also another thing like um, uh, fill rect fill uh, or rect and, and like the rectangle functions i don't like how you specify two corners i would prefer it if it was like a top left corner and the width and height uh, because quite often calculating the second corner is is as much work as calculating the first corner and quite often i have to I want to have like a square of a certain size at a certain position and the position is difficult to calculate but the square is like a very fixed size and then drawing it means I have to calculate the same difficult position two times. And it sucks. <laughs> I usually write, a, I, I, you can write a wrapper for this, but then that costs tokens and that sucks too. So there's kind of like no good solution. Uh, you probably cannot change this anymore, however, because, um, you know, a lot of uh, programs already defend, depend on how it works now. So you cannot change the current function. You could add a second function, but that would be really awkward. 
I don't think there's a good solution here. Also, another thing, I would love to be able to execute a program, even if it is beyond the token limit. I don't like how if you hit the token limit, you cannot execute the program anymore. Uh, that uh, really hampers your ability to code uh, at the token limit. Um, because sometimes you code a function and you know you hit the token limit, and then you cannot test the function. So in order to test the function, you have to take things out and that potentially introduces other bugs. Uh, so it would be great if you could just test the function and if you know it works, then you go in and start optimizing to get back underneath the, co the token limit. Um, yeah, that would be great. Next question by Yol Wukle. Yol, 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 Yol Wukle. Yol Wukle. <laughs> What are your hopes for the Pico8 community as it grows bigger and more diverse, e.g. the Pico Cat community? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that would be a more interesting question to ask to Zep. I'm not sure if I, you know, if, uh, I don't really have any goals. Um, it would be nice if um, there was more people playing Pico8 games. I think that would be really nice. Uh, right now, the Pico8 community is quite dominated by people who are making games, and that's fine. That's really good. Um, there's a lot of support if you get into Pico 8 because there's a lot of people making games with Pico 8. That's a really good place to be. Um, but also we are starting to amass quite a backlog of, or, or quite a repertoire of a lot of games that are fun to play. And it would be nice to see a bigger audience enjoying those games. And that's why I really enjoy whenever there is like uh, podcasts or YouTube channels uh, um, curating Pico 8 games, going through uh, our library of games and highlighting interesting games from that library. I think this is very good. This will might get more people on board. This will also help people get into uh, the Picoverse. Um, so like two channels I really especially en enjoy and shout out at this point are um, uh, Pico Playtime. I think this is a highly underrated channel, um, just like, you know, uh, a dude going through a game, a uh, Pico 8 game every now and then and just showing like, hey, this is a cool game. This is why it's cool. Uh, I think this is really great. Uh, I also like um, the podcast Pursuing Pixels, who are generally about, you know, small independent games um, and like retro games. They recently discovered Pico 8 and they are really excited about, about it and they often showcase Pico 8 games, among other uh, games. This is also really cool because um, this embeds Pico 8 community in like a larger context. Some other, so other people from, uh, who are interested in these kinds of games have an opportunity to discover Pico 8 community through their eyes. And that's also really fun. And those people specifically also are not necessarily Pico 8 developers. And that's really exciting to see somebody being hyped about uh, Pico 8 without necessarily uh, getting into programming immediately. This is good. Next question by Mishi Ko um, asks, what kind of physical hardware do you imagine Pico 8 running on? Do you think of Pico 8 as a fantasy hardware as much as, much as its software? Or do you think of it like a game engine, uh, just like any other? Um, I, uh, Okay, so Pico 8 is certainly not a game engine like any other. Um, I think the restrictions of Pico 8 are the point. Um, and I, like, yeah, the coziness of it is a big deal um, in a way that is not present with other engines. Um, uh, in a sense that um, they, they give you something that other engines are not giving you. You could make, technically, you could make any game that you make in Pico 8, you could make in another uh, engine most of the time. Um, but the experience of doing so and the uh, design thinking that you do in Pico 8 is different than uh, the way it would be in the different engines. And that's the value of Pico 8, like having to think in this small box uh, really does good things to your design process. So yeah, um, I don't think the Pico 8 stuff is is like other game engines. It does different things than other engines. It's not just about making something possible. It's also about making a lot of things impossible so you don't waste time thinking about them, <laughs> if, if that's maybe a more uh, concise way of putting it. As for hardware, I don't think about it as hardware, to be honest. Um, all the you know 
console stuff that I've been working on, like making it run on console stuff, it made me just realize that it is um, it is a lot of make believe, uh, not in a bad way. It's just like it's um, it's a bit of like a, a retro theater to some extent, right? It's um, the restrictions are not uh, rooted in any uh, hardware decisions. Um, and you notice this as soon as you start working with actual uh, hardware, retro hardware, and you realize that you know retro hardware is tr always trying to maximize your options, um, given you know specific hardware limitations. Um, and Pico Eight is not doing that; it's picking the restrictions uh, regardless of the underlying hardware. And another thing is that when I started doing the research for the um, uh, memory, uh, understanding memory video, I realized that, you know, a lot of the memory in Pico 8 uh, is not actually, you know, responsible for all the calculations and all the variables. They are not actually mapped on the memory, you know, uh, and that would be in a normal hardware system. And so that makes, you know, hard, um, the memory manipulation less powerful for Pico 8. Um, and it, it becomes obvious how there, you know, the memory is kind of like this, again, like this made up memory. It's not really how memory works in, in, in real, uh, um, hardware projects. Um, because there's, you know, the, there's the made up, there's the fake memory, and then there is like some real memory that is happening behind the curtain that you have no access to because that's where Pico 8 is, is actually happening. Um, so yeah, so that's that's why I don't really think about uh, about it as physical hardware anymore. But that doesn't mean that if somebody you know develops some kind of cool hardware project that runs Pico 8, that I won't be happy about it and I won't look at it. Absolutely not. Do your uh, yeah, yeah, knock yourself out. That would be really exciting to see. Um, yeah, next question by Loms. Uh, which part of making uh, games is the best for you? Programming, drawing, sprites, making music? Um, I don't make music, <laughs> so that's already <laughs> that's already out of the question. Um, yeah, it's I think it's equal 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 size programming and drawing sprites or like, like graphical stuff. I, I kind of really li like programming graphical things. It's it's fun to make things happen on the screen. That's kind of like a very pure motivation. Uh, when uh, programming things, when developing stuff. And that's something I want to focus more in the future when making like beginner tutorials, focusing more on just like the joy of making things happen on the screen. I think this is really fun. Uh, yeah, um, Pico 8 is quite often that, and that's why I appreciate it. Like a lot of programming with other, uh, you know, um, engines, other development environments is all about, you know, like just abstract structures and making data flow from one object to another. And that's just really dumb and boring and not fun. Why would you waste your time doing this? Just don't do it. Anyway, moving on. Uh, next question. Uh, Dovuro, uh, why do people willingly eat kale? I have no clue. Uh, I do like kale in uh, Stardew Valley because with all the other vegetables, I always have like, oh no, I'm selling this delicious stuff. But with kale, I have no scruples just selling all of it, just get rid of that stuff. So I plant a lot of kale so I can sell it without any hard feelings. Moving on, uh, Pacho Incus asks, what is your least favorite mechanic in video games? Um, hmm. um, okay, so least favorite is actually quite easy to answer because um, at least favorite things are quite often things that you see too often, right? You see like, oh, this is just, we, this is something we do often and I don't like it because it's overused. And uh, an overused mechanic that I see quite often that I don't think is really good or could be better, is parry. Hmm. So parry is something that um, got popularized by Dark Souls, obviously. Uh, it existed before, um, but it got really popular with Dark Souls, and now everybody's got crazy for it because people love Dark Souls, and um, it gets put in every game, uh, seemingly, and I never have fun with parry. I never had fun with parry in in Dark Souls either. Uh, it's um, <sighs> the problem I have with parry is that it is a little mini game, basically like a little tiny little snippet that you put in in somewhere, and um, the it has very poor communication. It has very poor visual feedback on what is happening, uh, and they make you do it. 
and there is a lot of stakes involved. Um, and you have to learn a lot by trial and error. Uh, so big stakes and also try and error means that there's just a lot of frustration happening uh, only to get to a point where the game is kind of fun. Uh, it just, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a good, it doesn't feel good. I think like the process of getting there doesn't feel good when you can parry then everything is fine again, but the process of learning it, acquiring that skill is not fun. Um, so the problem is like, if you think about it, parry is about pressing a button at the right time. Like there's like a, it's basically like a tiny little QTE, like a quick time event, right? With quick time events, you have like a nice animation playing and there's a prompt, now press button X now. And you press button X and then oh, something cool happens. And if you don't press button X, oh, something horrible happens. And that's basically what a parry thing is. Like the enemy attacks you and you have to wait for the right moment. And now you play, press a button and then something cool happens. Um, but the problem is um, it doesn't it doesn't show you that you have to press the button now. So you don't know what the timing is. It tries to communicate the timing through very nebulous ways, through the animation of the enemy. And there's nothing about the animation of the enemy that tells you when you're supposed to press it. And if you fail it, you don't know why you failed it. You don't know if you press too early or too late, or maybe that's not even an attack that can be parried. It's it's quite there's sort of ambiguity floating around, um, and again that just leads to frustrations. You just like, you don't know what's happening and you get owned and it's just. Ugh. There are some games where kind of like parry mechanics, um, where they worked on getting the parry mechanics communicated more clearly. Um, one example is um, Batman Arkham Asylum. And it had like this kind of like wavy lines, um, like like Spidey Sense wavy wavy lines appearing uh, over our characters, and also like uh, button prompts. Um, then you know you press Y now, and then it will do like a parry thing. Um, that problem with there is I don't think it was very consistent. Like sometimes it just wouldn't show it, so you couldn't rely on it. And generally, Batman Arkham Asylum was you know it was the, the battles were very chaotic. And you do, did a lot of crowd control, so I don't know. It wasn't just. A, I don't think it was a very good match for parry. I'd use it a little bit, but you didn't have to use it. So, eh. um, I think a good example of how this can be done very well, but don't people don't think about because it's not necessarily you know Dark Souls is Gears of War, the you know power reloading thing in Gears of War. I think that was amazing. That worked really well. So if you don't know what I'm talking about in Gears of War, you shoot with a gun, right? And uh, uh, when you reload, there's uh, like a little mini game happening. Like you basically get like a little slider on the bottom and you can, if you press at the right moment, uh, reload again, then it will do like a fast reload and then the next clip will do more damage. But if you don't, if you miss the, 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 the timing or if you don't press any button at all, then it will just do like a, a little bit longer reload and then you won't get the bonus. And that's, an example of how to get it right, I think, because you get a very, very clear feedback. You know, you you see like a little slider, like a little golfing mini game, basically, and you know exactly where you're supposed to press. Uh, and also, there is the the punishment for getting it wrong is very, very low. So there, it it wasn't if uh, it was the same mechanic, but it was implemented in a way that was completely not not punishing and not frustrating. It was in fact very very fun. It was just like really fun to to like a power reload and just like continue doing your thing. It's it was a good game. I think parry can work better with projectile attacks because a projectile attack you can see it coming. You know exactly what the timing is. So that's what something I would maybe also add. Uh, but yeah, like with character animations, I don't, I'm not a fan of parry. That's my rant right there. <laughs> Moving on. Note is asking, what are some of your favorite mechanics in video games? Um, so favorite is a bit difficult um, because, um, yeah, you like things for a lot of things. And it's also difficult to extract a, th a mechanic that you like from the context. Quite often it's the context of the entire game that makes a mechanic really fun and enjoyable and just removing it from the context kind of makes it like wither away like pulling a plant out of earth you know but i have a list of games that i enjoy because of some specific mechanics mm, uh, first one is not specifically a video game it's a root by cole Werle, uh, the board game root 
Um, Carl Werler is a, a really smart guy who does a great job at using mechanics to convey um, a, a historical historical situations. Cole is somebody who is familiar with history and he makes games. In his games, he creates like these depictions of historical confrontations and uh, he uses game mechanics to convey certain um, historical truths or interpretations of, of history or uh, to, to give you an idea of what a certain position in or dilemma in a certain uh, historical confrontation was. Uh, Root is not necessarily uh, anything about a specific period in history. That's an unusual game for him. He has more you know, specific games about that. Uh, but Root kind of brings in a lot of the ideas that he had from the other games and puts it in a context that is uh doesn't seem like it seems like very lighthearted and then you play it and you realize oh my gosh are we invading afghanistan right now <laughs> that's that's how it feels um and it does it like with some it, it is just pure game mechanics right um yeah so this is really fun i i'm not going to go into details exactly you have to try it out yourself but um uh yeah this is really good uh, another game I wanted, wanted to shout out, uh, I, I already did it, I think, in the pork -like tutorial, but I still want to shout out because it's one of my favorite games of recent times in terms of like game mechanics. It's Into the Breach by Subset Games, so basically follow up to FTL, uh, if that doesn't tell you anything. It's a strategy game, and there's like a... There, I love a lot of things about that game, but there's one specific thing that I really like. And that is, so the game has no, generally, no uh, random number generation. It's a tactics game where all of the attacks are predictable. You know exactly what will happen. Uh, there's no, you know, RNG deciding the outcome of a battle. Uh, you know exactly how much damage you will do. Uh, and that's, that's fun. I think this is really uh, good. Um, there is some RNG in the game, though. And that is when an enemy attacks you. Uh, they have like this system where if you get attacked, um, there is certain percent chance that the attacker gets blocked by a shield. Mm, but uh, yeah, you don't know if it will happen. Um, so this is smart. This is really, really smart. That this happens when you get attacked, but it doesn't happen when you attack an enemy. Uh, that allows you to make plans because you know exactly what will happen. You don't have to rely on on a run number generator, you know exactly if your attack will hit or not. But when you get attacked, you um, basically if you get attacked, you made a mistake. You screw, screwed up somewhere. Like you di weren't able to mate and and meet. You had to sacrifice something, and that sacrifice is you getting attacked. And it's smart that in this situation, there is a chance that you will survive. Uh, that even if you have you know just one health point and you uh, getting attacked means certain death, um, there is a chance that you will still survive, and that uh, leads um, eliminates a lot of like you know um, lost cause kind of situations where it's like okay I have no chance to get out of there like there is the, the game stays exciting all the way until you lose your last health point, and that's a that's that's very smart that's really good game design and it's really good implementation of this kind of random number generator kind of thing. So yeah, this is something I really enjoyed a lot. This is something that, that made me go like, aha, that, that's how that's how you you can implement this. Uh, another game I would shout out with a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, niche game is called uh, Rim 9000. It's a weird looking uh, uh, shmup. It actually uses the Pico 8 palette in some way, like a tweak of a Pico 8 palette. Uh, obviously not using Pico 8, it's bigger resolution. It's incredible visual design. Uh, I would not recommend trying this game if you have any uh, history of epilepsy in your family, because it's very difficult on the eyes, but also like incredibly radical in visual and audio experience. Um, but that's actually not the way I'm bringing it up. It's not necessarily a shmup that enjoys um, high praise from the shmup community. It's kind of like an outsider art, so to speak. Um, it has a really smart mechanic uh, of what happens when you get hit. So a lot of shmups don't have health points. You just get hit and then you're dead. And that's good. I think more games should be that. Um, but also 
it can be very frustrating because you know you may be doing really well and then you get hit and then you lose all your progress. Uh, so the question is, how can you in this situation, how can you implement some kind of shield or you know something that, that allows you to uh, absorb at least one hit, so you don't get, so you don't lose the game completely when you get hit by stray bullets. And uh, the way uh, they implemented it in Rim 9000 is really smart and really good. So when you get hit, your ship becomes stronger. You kind of like get into the, this kind of like, um, I, th I think the idea is that your reactor is basically, you know, on the verge of exploding. Uh, and that actually uh, gives your shot more power. So you do actually more damage in this state. Um, uh, and so you're kind of like, you know, you're shaking and, and everything starts really, really crazy, but also, you know, you're doing more damage. And then after a while, you know, and a power up floats in and if you pick up that power up, you get back to your normal state. But it introduces like this uh, fun, you know, risk reward mechanic where a good player might want to always play in this unhinged, this, this damaged mode. Uh, because they will defeat the enemies faster, uh, but they will also lose like this, you know, this shield, this leniency of of getting a surviving one hit. Really smart design. I don't understand why shmups don't use this kind of design more. I think I want to use this some something similar like as well. I think this is smart if um, you couple. Uh, getting damaged with some kind of other effect that changes the gameplay. I think um, I th a good example of that is also um, Super Mario World um, 2, uh, the one where you are um, Yoshi and there's baby Mario on top of you, right? Because then when you get hit, baby Mario floats away in a bubble and you have to catch baby Mario. And that's really smart because getting hit really changes the way it plays out. So uh, once you get hit and you know the baby Mario floats away, you suddenly really have to change your um, priorities because suddenly the highest priority becomes getting Mario back, and then uh, and then it creates like this hectic situation. And you, of course, you don't want to get hit, um, but also you are not necessarily punished for it. You're just kind of like rewarded with more gameplay for getting hit, uh, even if that game gameplay is maybe a more more hectic. And I think this is a good way of thinking about how to punish people or how to how to implement consequences to failure that is exciting rather than just uh, you dying or you you know getting getting wounded that's that's boring and finally uh, yeah i would also shout out witch and whiz which is a game that just recently came out uh, which is um it's an nes game that came out uh, in now in 2021. Somebody made an NES game for the NES. If you buy it on Itch.io, you will get an .NES file that you can pl play in an emulator. That's kind of amazing. Um, and also, but that's not necessarily the thing that uh, that why I recommend it. Uh, I recommend it because it has um, some fascinating game mechanics. Um, it is a puzzle game um, that is played from the side view and it kind of looks a little bit like a simple platformer. It has like some mechanics that are make sense from the perspective of a platformer. And, but it's a puzzle game. It's kind of like a Sokoban style puzzle game. Uh, and it's fascinating because you, it has very intricate mechanics but it doesn't require any kind of tutorial, basically, because the mechanics make sense if you ever played a uh, jump and run. Yeah, there's like vines and ladders, and it makes sense that you climb up the vine, and you can walk on platforms, and you can move blocks around. Like all of the things are very familiar, and but then they are combined in a way that is unique and that you ha that I haven't seen before, and it's crazy because it feels like game like a game that you've already know that you are already familiar with and yet it's a completely new game that you never played before uh, i think this is exciting when something like this happens uh, it's kind of unique and uh, i would definitely recommend it anyway next um question is a uh, binge asks it was cool to see you shout out which and whiz on twitter i just did it again and um, any other games that you think fans of lazy devs would appreciate um so um, fans of lazy devs <laughs> um 
I don't know. I don't really have. I don't. I don't feel I, I can give you like like things that combine all of the games that I made. I'm not sure. Sure, if I'm, I could probably like point out things that if you like one of my games, then you should check out this other thing. Um, but I'm actually way more interested. I'm going to change this question. Like, if you like Witch and Wiz, what other games I would um, recommend? And that's interesting because Witch and Wiz is kind of part of this new aesthetic or genre uh, that uh, I think is kind of like more developing slowly. I hope to see more entries in that genre, which is making uh, modern indie games that are retro, that specifically look as if they come uh, from the NES, from the Nintendo Entertainment System, like from the old NES. Um, Not necessarily, uh, you know, made for the NES, but kind of look as if they were made for the NES. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. There is a very famous game called um, Shovel Knight. And that, I think, was like one of the first games that did that because it looked, uh, you know, like DuckTales on the NES, kind of, right? Like it just upscaled a little bit, but kind of still, you can still see, like you could imagine maybe a simpler version of that running on the NES. So Witch and Wiz is kind of like fits into that aesthetic, that, that kind of genre basically. And uh, I have some examples of, of games that you could try out if you like that. So uh, recently I checked out also Panzer Paladin, uh, which again is very similar to kind of like Shovel Knight, except um, it's with a giant mech. And uh, there's a, uh, you can press a button and the mech opens up and a little tiny pilot comes out and that pilot can then do jump and run stuff. Uh, and it's really fun and there's like tons of weapons that you can pick up and you can like design your own weapons. Uh, it mechanically, it's not as sophisticated as um, a Shovel Knight, I think. Uh, but I kind of like it more because of that, because I think Shovel Knight, I, I was tired of Shovel Knight at some point because I was like, oh, it got really difficult and you get into map screen and you can visit all the locations and there's like mysteries at every location. I'm like, just give me some platforming, you know? <laughs> and uh, it got really hard as well. Like, I don't really like the bosses in in a lot of games. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Panzer Paladin is kind of like my, way more straightforward. It's just like, you know, here's a game, here's a platformer, just play it and it's good. And it has max. Uh, another game that just, uh, just a couple of days ago I discovered was is called Astalon. Um, that is also a platformer that looks like uh, if it was on, on, made on the NES. Uh, and that is kind of like more of a... Um, um, Metroidvania kind of thing. So you have like a big map that you explore. Uh, it also has additionally this um, rogue light mechanic that is popular these days where if you die, uh, you um, can spend some money on upgrades and then you get reborn and then now your character is stronger. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of that, but it kind of works in this situation. I don't mind it too much. Um, the, compared to Panzer Paladin and even Shovel Knight, it is a lot more restrained. Uh, I don't know. It's hmm. it's more focused, I think, in the, in, uh, the aesthetic. Like it's uh, it has incredibly fluid animations going beyond of what NES was cop- capable, way beyond. Um, but also the the designs of the levels are very blocky. Like you can clearly see the blocks that they are made of. It's kind of like an aesthetic that they're playing with. And I really appreciate it for that. Like it looks looks really nice, I think. Uh, uh, Nice, but not necessarily flashy. And that's that's something I appreciate. Um, And then third third recommendation is something that's not in the NES aesthetic, but it is also, like Witch and Wiz, is also a game that is recently made for a console that is very, very old. Um, so uh, the game I'm talking about is GG Alast 3. So that's another shmup that it was, <laughs> that I'm doing. I was doing a lot of research for shmups and that's another shmup I discovered. So this is a game that came out in, I don't know if it was 2021 or last year, I don't even remember, but it came recently out. And it is a game made for the Game Gear. So for uh, Sega's competitor to the Game Boy, that was one of the first color portable console. Uh, so yeah, it came out on a Game Gear technically. Uh, the funny thing is you cannot actually play it on a Game Gear. <laughs> 
uh, because it came out. Uh, um, uh, I got it, I'm playing it on a Switch. There's a, a collection called the GGLS collection. So it's like a, um, the G LS is a series of games um, that came out you know, on various platforms on G Game Gear, but also I think on the Master System. And the GGLS collection is like all of those games uh, remastered, um, not, not remastered, but you know, just basically emulated for uh, the Switch with a lot of added uh, little features that are really nice. Um, it's made by this company called M2, and it's part of the M2 Shot Trigger series, which are very well known, you know, taking old uh, um, arcade games uh, shmups and then, you know, creating like a luxurious way of playing them on modern consoles. They are incredibly expensive. They are full price games in Japan. They are available on a Japanese, um, you know, store, and you can get a physical copy too. The physical copy is even more expensive. Uh, the funny thing about the physical copy is like there's like a deluxe version that ships with a tiny little Game Gear. You know, the, there's like the uh, Game Gear Mini that you can get now, which is like a very, very tiny Game Gear, like, you know, like a keychain kind of size. And they put the GGLS on that Game Gear so you can just play this <laughs> on this tiny little Game Gear, which is to me is hilarious. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't get that. I just got the digital version, which was already quite uh, way expensive. But yeah, on that collection, uh, to spice up the collection, they created a brand new game in the series, and that's GGLS3. Long explanation. Anyway, um, that is uh, interesting because it's, um, again, it's the same thing like with Witch and Wiz. It's, uh, you know, with today's technology, with today's understanding of game design, extremely talented developers who are, you know, veterans of the industry, very, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the shmup genre, are, you know, doing a game for an old platform. And you can see what a difference it makes, how much better we are now at making games than, you know, the people were back then when you know, in the 80s and 90s, how much better our games are now today. And not not because the technology is better, but because our understanding of making games is better. Uh, and also, I guess maybe tools are better as well. So yeah, GGLS 3 looks amazing for being a Game Gear game. I mean, you can tell that it's Game Gear game, but it's still like it's, it looks a lot better than the previous entries in the LS series. And it is also very, very fun to play. It's a fun shmup that is definitely a retro shmup, no doubt about it. Um, and I was playing it because I was interested how it deals with the hardware limitations. Uh, I was trying to find um, takeaways for making uh, games on the Pico 8, similar games on the Pico 8, because the Game Gear is kind of like close to the Pico 8 in certain ways, I thought. So yeah, it was fun playing that game and, and learning from it. And I would recommend you jumping in it as well. I will have to say it is expensive. So maybe do it only if you can afford it and if you really like shmups. All right, got a little bit lengthy there at the end. So yeah, this was 7,000 subscribers. Now, if you like Q and A's, if you like me talking, if you like if this, this video is something that you enjoyed, I have good news for you. There's more of that. So um, there's a coffee thing that I started recently where you can um, make small donations, but you can also become a subscriber. One of the things that you get as a subscriber is some bonus features. And one of the bonus features that you get, uh, or like rewards, I guess, is um, there is a lazy dev vlog that I do every month. So every month I will sit down and talk about my work and the things I'm working on and the challenges in your everyday life and so forth. Videos very similar to the one that you're watching right now. So if this is something that you like, then um, then if you become a monthly subscriber on Coffee, you will get you know four more at this point. I think four more videos like this, uh, and you will get one more video every month. Now I will share with you a little trick. Uh, on a page it says it's only available for subscribers, but I usually unlock those videos as well for one-time payments. So if you are not willing or not ready to do like a monthly commitment to my coffee, that's fine. You can also do like a, you know, one-time donations and then you will also get access to the lazy devlog. 
So yeah, that's a little trick that I just, that's gonna be just between me, you and me, okay? And also at this point, I would like to do a big thank you to all of the people that supported me on Kofi. So I will show a list of all of the supporters on Kofi. And also I wanted to do a like, shout out to all of the donut tier plus supporters. It's gonna be Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Makanai, Scott Goldsmith, who has a crazy username that I'm not gonna even start pronouncing, Bretsky, Emperor Snow, Hnork, and all caps. Thank you so much for supporting me if you're supporting me on coffee, and thank you for subscribing to this channel. Thank you for staying with me for such a long time. Um, thank you for all the questions. I was really glad to answering them. And if you have any more questions, you can post them in the comment section and I will try to answer them next time around when we do one of those things. I'm not gonna do these kind of Q and A's too often, but maybe like twice a year or so. I don't know, it feels kind of about right. So the next video that's coming out is going, coming out very soon. Um, it's gonna be uh, coming out this month, hopefully, if things go right. Uh, and I will take a look at the new Pico 8 version that ju just came out. And I will also look at the version that came out last time, which I kind of skipped. So I will do like a two-in-one um, review of the last two Pico 8 versions. So yeah, look forward to that. But yeah, otherwise the last couple of months the videos were quite involved. So I wanted to focus this month and maybe even the next month a little bit more on working on the next tutorial series. So uh, the videos might not be quite as involved. Just letting you know what is happening right now. That is it guys. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for supporting me. See you next time around guys. Bye bye.